Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Those of you who have been following along with us week by week know that we've been studying the life of Jesus quite closely. And uh, we're getting right down towards the end. As a matter of fact, uh, this time we want to take a look at Jesus' last Saturday night. Where do we go? Well, it was a feast. He went out on a party. It was they, all of his disciples and his followers were sure that it was Passover season was coming up. Millions or thousands at least, hundreds of thousands of people were coming to Jerusalem. It's estimated by one scholar that there were up to two million people that descended on Jerusalem Passover weekend. And Jesus has come down. He's there. Great crowds are there. They're saying, okay, this is the time we're going to make him king. And so Simon, who is cured of leprosy, invites Jesus to his house. Now he's a Pharisee. Simon is a Pharisee. And he invites Jesus to his house to, to um, have a meal. And that uh, experience is, is discussed in several places. One of the best places is in Matthew 26, uh, verse 6. But before we read that, we need to go back and look at verses 1 to 5 and verses 14 to 16 because this is the, the plot that's going on behind the scenes. So let's just read those verses first. When Jesus had finished teaching all these things, he said to his disciples, and this is... This is looking forward. In two days, as you know, it will be the Passover festival and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders met together in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, and made plans to arrest Jesus secretly and put him to death. We must not do it during the festival, they said, or the people will riot. Now, let's understand clearly what's happening here. It's the week before Passover week. It's this week when the people arrive in Jerusalem and prepare themselves, go through all the cleansing ceremonies, etc., preparing themselves for Passover, which in this case, Passover is going to come on Friday. And uh, so they're getting ready. That's what's, that's what's going to happen. And then we, so we know that the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, especially the Pharisees, have been w trying to arrest Jesus, trying to catch him in some, some way or other and arrest him for, for two, three years almost now. And so what, we, what happens is, verses 14 to 15 in Matthew 26, Then one of the twelve disciples, the one named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They counted out thirty silver coins and gave them to him. From then on, Judas was looking for a good chance to hand Jesus over to them. So now that's the, the mood that's going on behind the scenes. So now we go back to verse 6. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had suffered from a dreaded skin disease, and of course, traditionally that's called leprosy. Mm -hmm. While Jesus was eating, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar filled with an expensive perfume, which she poured on his head. The disciples saw this and became angry. Why all this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold for a large amount and the money given to the poor. Now, see if you can guess who started that discussion. It was Judas. It had to be Judas. Had to be Judas, exactly. Because why? Money bags. He, he was money the bags. treasure. He's the one who carried the money around, right? And helped himself quite generously. Jesus knew what they were saying, and so he said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? It is a fine and beautiful thing that she has done for me. She will always, you will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. What she did was to pour this perfume on my body, to get me ready for burial. By the way, how many other people got a chance to put perfume or anything, sort of gifts for Jesus for his burial? How many people, how many people 
well, were no. had the understanding that he was going to be buried at this time. No, I, I'm not. Mean, I'm talking at any time. Who else get, was able to do something with Jesus' body when it was dead? I believe Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Nicodemus brought, put, something. brought something, and Joseph, and Joseph of Arimathea yeah. uh, offered his. And, but the women brought their stuff. But by the time they got here, it was already raised. Yeah, they tried. <laughs> so here we have Mary, who's the only one, and elsewhere we're told that this was Mary. Mary does this before he dies. Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus try to do something just after he's dead, and they're the only ones who got to do anything to try to, you know, commiserate with his death. How did, you know, when Jesus told the disciples that he was going to be crucified, mm -hmm. they didn't believe him. So, yeah. how, how is, does Mary know what she's doing here? Mary thinks that she's anointing him to be king. So he's giving them another clue here yeah. of what is happening. Yeah. Simon had some interesting reaction to that, didn't he? Yes, he did. And that's found over in, in Luke 7. And it's a very interesting thing because some people say, well, what's going on here? Um, you know, how, did Jesus go to Simon's house twice? No, but <clears throat> Luke decides, for whatever reason, that he needs to put this story much earlier in the account of, of Jesus' life so that people can understand things that are going to happen later. So if you jump over to Luke 7, here's the rest of the story. A Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him, and Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was... Which verse? Well, I'm sorry, Luke 7, starting with verse 36. Um, now we're in verse 37. She heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and stood behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, If this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of a sinful life she lives. Though Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, tell me. There were two men who owed money to a money lender, Jesus began. One owed him five, 500 silver coins. And how much is, what are these silver coins? What are they worth? Day's wage, isn't it? One silver coin was a day's wage, a laboring man's wage for a day. So 500, this is, this is almost two years worth of work, okay? One man owed him 500 silver coins and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which one then will love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, that it would be the one who was forgiven more. You're right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to, he turned to the woman, notice, and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your home and you gave me no water for my feet. I mean, Simon was a Pharisee. I mean, you were just incredibly honored just to be invited to his house right? You didn't expect him to wash your feet and take care of you, all that kind of stuff. But she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil for my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then that the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The others sitting at the table began to say to themselves, Who is this who ever forgives sins? Who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So that's the other part of the story. Now, How did Simon know she was a sinner? That's a good question. It says she was known as a sinner in the town. Before you, can you mention that here in Luke, in regards to this story, that he kind of puts it out of sequence. So, should we under should we understand that 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 uh, Luke has in mind here in in parts of his his story here that it's not necessarily a chrono chronological situation. At times, maybe put stories together. These are the stories of Jesus and et cetera, et cetera. We shouldn't look necessarily to Luke for an for an accurate chronology. Yes, Matthew even does more of that than Luke does. Matthew is more topical. 
Luke is a little bit topical. Mark is more chronological. John is the most chronological. He's the most reliable in terms of one thing follows another. So yeah, some of the disciples when they wrote felt like it was more important to put topics together. Matthew did a lot of that. Luke did some. Mark less. John the least. Okay? <coughs> Could it be because he wasn't there that he because he had to do a lot of research because mm -hmm. he had to use what they call Q? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So but he, but he, in fact, got a lot of his story correct, and yes. he, he did he did a lot of a lot of careful research. Yes. Yeah. So Simon, Simon. Well, it turns out that if you look carefully in the writings of Ellen White and you Seventh Day Adventists are familiar with her, she was one of our founding fathers. Mothers, I guess I should say. Um, but she says that in fact Simon was uncle to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Furthermore, she says Simon was the one who led Mary into sin. So, how did he know she was a wicked woman in the town? First hand. First hand. Yeah. And here he is, the, the great grand guy who's who's putting on a feast for the guy who's going to be anointed king tomorrow, right? That's what he thinks. He hopes. That's what he hopes. And, you know, he can't worry himself with, you know, details like making sure his feet are clean and he's taken care of nicely. Desire of Ages 2, uh, 38. He himself, speaking of Simon, had led into sin the woman he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him. And by the two debtors of the parable, Simon and the woman are represented. Simon's sin is shown to be tenfold greater than that of the woman, as much greater as the debt of 500 pence is greater than the debt of 50 pence. Mm -hmm. This is a very bold, um, and it would appear to me a, uh, an uncommon proposition here about this relationship with Simon and Mary. Where would, you know, some are quick to, to, to say that, that uh, Ellen White has borrowed a lot of her materials. Is there any, any, anybody else ever made such a proposition? This is very, un this is unusual um, uh, color. It is. Story. Well, and if you remember our discussion last time, she said that when talking about the Good Samaritan, she says that the priest who passed the Samaritan, I mean, passed the Jew, yeah. the, the guy had been injured, the priest who passed him by and the Levite who passed him by were in the crowd when Jesus told that story. And the story was known by people to be a true story. Probably the guy who was involved, the guy who got beaten, probably was telling everybody. But Christ, mm -hmm. Simon got the message, mm -hmm. and uh, he saw Christ in a new light yep. and saw him as, as divine because he perceived that he actually knew the details. Yep. Well, you go back to, uh, what, back to uh, 39, and he, he thought, if this guy was a, a prophet, why would he let this woman touch it? Yep. I mean, they, they had, had a 180 degree flip on he things. Did. I mean, it was he a did. serious uh, yep. shock to his psyche. <laughs> Would you say abuse is as old as humanity? Yes. We worry about it today. It was obviously around long yeah. ago. I mean, this is, you know, we have no word about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's parents. It's very likely that they died early. It's also a pretty good chance that Simon sort of was a father figure to them, which would make this be an active case of incest. Incest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Jesus rebukes the disciples. He rebukes specifically Judas for his comments about the money. Judas goes out that night and signs a contract with the, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When I get a chance, I'll hand him over to you. What happened the next morning? The well, we look, look at Matthew 21. Now, I told you that Matthew is topical rather than chronological. Go back to Matthew 21, starting with verse 1. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, 
they, and now remember we said that they had come, previously he'd been ministering across the Jordan River on the other side of Jericho in a pagan area and he came up for the, fa for the Passover, he'd gone past Jerusalem, well actually depending on which way he came, but he, he, lived, he went to Bethany I believe. And I asked to go past Bethphage and on to Jerusalem to go to the temple. So uh, they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of the disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied up with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything, tell him, the master needs them, and then he will let them go at once. This happened in order to make come true what the prophet had said, tell the city of Zion, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey and, a, on, a, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, what's the background of this prophecy, etc.? Well, it's prophesied that when the Messiah comes, this is, this is the way he, this is a sign of, of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's also, wasn't this also a traditional way that the king uh, when he was anointed, uh, would yeah. this was the official coronation of the king, so to speak. So what did you think the disciples, how do you think the disciples were feeling as they were instructed to do this? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> long <laughs> last. Finally. finally, he's getting with it. He's finally realizing what he should have realized a long time ago, right? It won't be long now. <laughs> yeah, so the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donk and the colt, threw their cloaks over them, and Jesus got on. A large crowd. Now, remember, this is the week before, well, most, almost a week still until Passover started, but there were huge crowds gathering in Jerusalem in preparation. Uh, a large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout, praise to David's son. And what, do we, what are we saying when we're saying praise to David's son? New king. A new king. Yeah. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise be to God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he, the people ask. This is a prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee, the crowds answered. So, what happens? Mm -hmm. Well, you need to go over to Mark 11 to pick up what happens next. You kind of wonder where Herod is in all this. Uh, Herod is in Jerusalem, but this is not Herod. This is not Herod's territory. Herod is responsible for the territory on the other side of the Jordan. So when he comes into this territory, he he's a Jew coming for the Passover. But this territory is under the, the direct control of Pilate, not Herod. So Jesus would be a threat to Pilate. If, I mean, well, we've got a king if, if, coming yeah, here. Who yeah, is exactly. he a threat to? Yeah, no, well, he's, I guess he's ultimately Caesar. But. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. To the Roman government. Sure. Um, look at, look at um, what, what Mark says about this. Mark 11, starting with verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem near the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions and the same instructions. So they went and found a colt. They answered just as Jesus had told them, down to. Praise be to God. Jesus entered Jerusalem, verse 11, went into the temple and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. So this happened fairly late in the day, or at least it took a long time to happen. So Jesus basically got to the temple, looked around a little bit, went back home. Okay? What happened next? Went back to the temple the next morning. He went back to the temple early the next morning. We read about that in Matthew 21. Or Mark 11. Yeah. Right on from there. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah. We can go back to Mark 11. Norm, I mean, it, Matthew is a little more detailed. The next day as they were coming back from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He saw in the distance a fig tree covered with leaves, so he went to see if he could find any figs on it. But when he came to it, he found only leaves because it was not the right time for figs. Now, here's a, here's a fig tree with lots of leaves and no figs. What does that tell you? It's not summer, it's not time yet. Okay. But, but it was playing like it was time. Yes, yes. yes. It, it, was, it was giving the signs that a, that a fig tree should give when it had figs it, on it. Yeah, exactly. This kind of fig trees, 
believe it or not, and I used to have a fig tree like this in my backyard. The fruit actually comes out before the leaves come out. Mm -hmm. It drops its leaves in the winter. The fruit comes, now the fruit's not ready to eat, but the fruit, the fruit starts to show up, and then the leaves come out, and then finally, of course, the fruit ripens. So if you see a tree that's already got a lot of tree, leaves on it, what you expect is some ripe fruit, right? As Jesus said to the fig tree, no one shall ever eat figs from you again, and his disciples heard him. What do you suppose they thought when they heard that? Sounds like he was angry. Yeah. Angry. Why would Jesus say a thing like that? Uncharacteristic. Mm-hmm. Is this an analogy? Compared to what? Metaphor? <clears throat> Compared they to what? Uh, understand the plain talk. Why would he? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um about what Christians would say is going to happen to, to the Jewish um, nation at this time. Well, let's see what Jesus said about it. Drop down to verse 20, if you're still in Mark 11. Early the next morning, as they walked along the road, they saw the fig tree. It was dead all the way down to its roots. Peter remembered what had happened and said to Jesus, Look, teacher, the fig tree you cursed has died. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. I assure you that whoever tells this hill to get up and throw itself in the sea does not doubt in his, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he says what he says will happen. It will be done for him. So, what kind of an answer is that? Yeah, what kind of an answer is that? <laughs> Good question. Along with a mustard seed thing. <laughs> what? Okay, so let's, serious, why would Jesus say something like that? Have faith in God, he was his answer. Mm -hmm. If you have faith in God, you can do anything, everything. Okay, like what? have figs out of season? I mean, yeah. well, <laughs> what's well, the point? Well, hold on, there, yeah. there's a good point here. Yeah. What's Jesus trying to demonstrate? He, he has two or three things he's trying to teach his disciples, two or three huge things he's trying to teach his disciples, and then some things he's trying to say to the Jewish people in general. Can, do, you, do you know what those things are? Well, he's talked before about people having fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Yeah. So there's kind of a metaphor there that you had a fig tree. Mm -hmm. They went up to it. There was no fruit. Mm -hmm. they, he cursed it because it had no fruit. So in other words, if you have a fig tree that's putting on a lot of show and there's no fruit, what use is the tree? That's right. And so what if you have a group of people making a lot of show and they're not producing anything. Might be a parallel there. There might be a parallel. Yeah, the, the quotation, pretentious piety is nauseating, <laughs> comes to mind. Yeah. What does that have to do with faith moving mountains? Okay, well, now we're going to come to the next point. The next point that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, he's getting ready to die, he knows this. His disciples have not a clue. They are absolutely hell-bent on the fact that he's going to be king, okay? Jesus is trying to tell them, look, I want you to remember times like this when I'm dead and remember that I can control the elements, I can raise people from the dead, I can cure diseases, I can do anything I want. I can curse a tree and the next day it'll be dead down to the roots. What does that tell you? What does it say to you? Am I an ordinary Joe? No, I'm not an ordinary Joe. I am the divine <coughs> Messiah. Remember that next Friday. I didn't. Doesn't that, doesn't that demonstration seem a little subtle? I mean, why didn't he tell the moon to move over a little bit? That would have really <laughs> He's <laughs> told them four times, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles. They're going to spit on me, etc., etc. They're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And the disciples says, huh? The, I mean, uh, how, how many, what do you do? Uh, well, well um, and okay, but I, I don't see the point there because he's predicting all this stuff, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. They were locked in on making him king. That, that was yeah. the col yeah. colored he everything went, that they dealt with. He went to that tree looking for fruit, mm -hmm. looking for something that was right. Mm -hmm. Then no, he, he, no, is, he is now telling them how to find the fruit, how to find what is right via the faith. Yeah. He, he's, saying, he's saying, look, people who have faith in me will be able to do things like I do, miracles. 
And remember, this is, this is the thing that we often overlook. It's, it's, he's going to tell them that in the upper room, what, five days later, is it, whatever. John 13, I'm going to jump, jump over there for just a second. John 13, verse 19, he says, um, I tell you this now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe, that is, you will have faith, that I am who I am. I tell you this before, you see all these things adding up, and then when it happens, you're going to say, oh, guess what? He told us. He warned us. He gave us all, these, all this evidence. Where were we? What were we thinking? Right? So there is another parallel there. Mm -hmm. The, <coughs> the um, fig tree died. He's going to die. Mm -hmm. So there's another one there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you may, they may put that together after it happens. These stories and lessons that he's trying to teach him didn't have any impact right at that time, but it sure had staying power after the resurrection. Yep. And mm -hmm. they committed; they were committed so much that they all died an unnatural death except for John. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened next is very interesting. He goes to the temple. Now, what was Jesus' plan? What, what did he normally do when, when he was in Jerusalem? We've talked about this before. Let's see. Do you remember? Go to the temple. Well, he usually goes to the temple and yeah. heals people and carries okay, on. Okay, okay, but there's a very specific pattern here. He goes early morning to the temple. He goes to one of the porches, they were called. There were actually little bays, and the, the, the temple, the, the, the courtyard, was, which was supposed to be a place for Gentiles to come and worship God, was huge. The Jews had turned it into what? A little marketplace. A marketplace. Stock market. Yeah. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. stock, <laughs> yeah. No the ancient stock market, yeah, exactly, literally stock market. And Jesus would go to a, a, a one, one of those spots, and very quickly, huge crowds would gather around him. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees would show up to, to, to try to arrest him, what, what would be the problem? They too, couldn't arrest him. Too many people. There are too many people. And so he would stay there until late in the day, and then he would go home. So here, he would sit there, and he would preach and we're going to see he preaches terrible things against the, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, but they don't dare to do anything. He, I mean, he's, he's sitting in their headquarters, and he's talking like this, okay? So look what happens here. So the, the people were not afraid either. No. It, it, the children are not afraid of him. It was well, just we're going we're gonna to read about yeah, that. Yeah. You're getting a little ahead of the story. Look at Matthew 21 now, starting with verse 12. Jesus went into the temple and drove out all those who are buying and selling there. Now, we need to back up a little bit. Is this the first time Jesus has done this? No. When did he do it the first time? Early in his ministry. Yeah. Way back on the first Passover of his ministry, he did the same thing. What was the, what was the Pharisees and Sadducees, what did they say in response to that occasion? How could we let that happen? Yeah. He, he's just one person. Why did we run? What were we afraid of? We're never going to let that. We're never going to let him do that to us again. So what happens? They ran even faster yeah. the second time. I wonder if there's a, a reasonable parallel between the the fig tree, which is barren, and this religious system that they had yeah. going on yeah. was barren. Exactly. It had no. It wasn't Very anything so. useful. So we read on, he overturned the tables, the money changers, and the stools of those who sold pigeons. In other words, all the people who were robbing the, 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 the cronies who were robbing the people, and said to them, it is written in the scriptures that God said, my temple will be called a house of prayer. And you know we're going to have to stop and break there. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We were partway through the story about Jesus cleansing the temple. And there's some very interesting words here. Let's look at that again. I'm reading from Matthew 21, starting with verse 14. The blind and the crippled came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The chief priests and the teachers of the law became angry when they saw the wonderful things he was doing, and the children shouting in the temple, praise to David's son. So they asked Jesus, do you hear what they are saying? Indeed I do, answered Jesus. Haven't you ever read this scripture? You have trained children and babies to offer perfect praise. Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Now, I want to back up to verse 13. It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you made it into a hideout for thieves. What's a hideout for thieves? You know, we, we usually read through this carefully. We just, just sort of casually read across. And we, oh, yeah, they were, they were robbing people there in the temple, right? That's not what this verse says. What does it say? It's a hiding place, place for thieves. Hiding place. For what what happens in hiding places for thieves? They store their loot. Count their they store their there. loot and they divide it up, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is saying this temple is no longer a temple. It's a place where thieves divide up the loot. Think about that. There's a second very significant point here. Who did not run when Jesus drove them out? The children. The blind and the crippled were still there, and the children. So if a big man gets angry, really angry, and starts throwing the things around, who runs fastest? The children. The children. They weren't running. Why weren't they running? They had nothing to fear. They had nothing to fear. So in other words, what's going on here? Maybe the people that are running or have a flash in their head what they're doing, <laughs> and um, this is a this is a race to the exit by the guilty, yeah, guilty. <laughs> by the guilty, right? Yeah. yeah, which means it probably wasn't a big ruckus. If it had been a big a, a big ruckus, well, then the kids would have run. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, he 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 just took one look at them and they said, "Let me out of here," and then he went along and just. And it tipped over the phone, just to hear the money clink. Chased out the, <laughs> chased out the, well, in other words, it's a hideout for thieves. This is a place where they divide up the money. Well, there's a lot of other people could use this money. Yeah. Help yourself. Now Matthew was here along with the other disciples. That's how he has such an accurate report here. Exactly. He's, he's commenting about this unusual phenomenon. You know, sometimes I think that's what's going to happen in the new kingdom with sinners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the temple there, there was that, that atmosphere where sinners would have to run out because they want mm -hmm. to get away. Mm -hmm. That when the second coming comes, there's no place they can run. They just, mm -hmm. it'll be all over the place. They won't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the third coming, which we read about only in the book of Revelation, the wicked will be outside the city and the righteous will be inside the city because that's where they choose to be. Matthew refers to the fig tree story mm -hmm. after the cleansing mm -hmm. of the temple. Yes. Well, Matthew organizes things topically. He doesn't necessarily organize them chronologically. But when he does it that way, he, yeah. he, he makes it easier to understand mm -hmm. the lessons because he ties it right to the fruit. Mm -hmm. Well, look, at, uh, look now at verse 23 of Matthew 21. Jesus came back to the temple. This is now the next morning. And as he taught the chief, taught, the chief priests and elders came to him and asked him, what right do you have to do these things? Who gave you such right? So though they were always asking him questions like that. What, what, was they, what were they trying to accomplish? Well, trapping. Was trying to get him to blaspheme. Well, but yes, that's ultimate purpose, but First of all, in this to verse, what? Wrong. What? To prove him wrong. That okay, wrong. That's, that was the ultimate goal. But it, first of all, they want to do something else that's pointed out by this verse. They want to say, who's in charge here? You have no right to be speaking in this temple. You're not, you have no authority. You have no, you, you don't have a permit from the, high, from the high priest. You don't have any kind of authority. What are you doing here? 
They were trying to show we're the ones who have the authority. We're the ones who decide we, what will be taught in this temple. You have no right to be here. Yeah, you're right. But why did you run? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, exactly. <laughs> they were probably saying, where's your franchise? They have a yeah. table here. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus answered them, I will ask you just one question. And if you give me an answer, I will tell you what right I have to do these things. Where did John's right to baptize come from? And immediately, you know, they, were, they knew they were in trouble. Yeah. They knew they were in trouble. Was it from God or from human beings, Jesus says. They started to argue among themselves, what shall we say if we answer from God? He will say to us, why then didn't you believe John? But if we say from human beings, we're afraid of what the people might do because they all are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, uh, we don't know. Hmm. And he said to them, well, neither will I tell you then by what right I do these things. <laughs> RSV uses the term authority. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> What happens next? The parable of the two sons. Now, what do you think? There was once a man who had two sons. He went out to the older one and said, Son, go and work on the vineyard today. I don't want to, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said to the son, Yes, sir, he answered, but he did not go. Which one of the two did what his father wanted? The older one, the answer. So Jesus said to them, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John the Baptist came to you, showing you the right path to take, and you would not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw this, you did not later change your minds and believe him. So, <laughs> what's happening here is that we're going to see a sequence of things. There, there, this, 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 particularly the Pharisees, but also the scribes, the Sadducees are going to come with their questions for Jesus. And every one of them he's going to answer in a way that makes them look bad. Not intentionally, but that points out the next thing that Jesus is trying to accomplish. What's he trying to accomplish? The next thing he's trying to accomplish. Remove the priests and Sadducees from the authority figure. The Jewish people had been raised, even his disciples, his family. Think of the things they said to him have been raised from their childhood to believe that these people, these, this, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the, the scribes, these are the ultimate authority. If they say something, that's law, that's the, that's the rule, that's what you've got to go by. And Jesus, in order to, in order to have encourage his disciples, eventually they're going, to have to, they're going to have to raise up a church that's in direct opposition to these very people that they have looked at as being the ultimate authorities. And Jesus is going to have to convince them that you don't have to respect people when they're, when they're saying something that's wrong. So that's another thing he's trying to teach his disciples. Another interesting thing is that he, had them, he, he didn't do that behind their backs. No. He did it right in front of them, in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. So all these people, uh, you don't go around stabbing people in the back, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get your way. You go up in front and front of them and you confront them in front of everybody. Are there not systems in our world today that teach error mm -hmm. and, and put with on great authority. with great authority and people are trained to say yes, 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 Papa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So an authoritative mask, actually. Yeah. So. Well, listen to another parable. Jesus is going to go on here. Jesus said, there was once, and now we're reading verse 33 of, of Matthew 21. There was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to tenants and left home on a trip. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. Now, how much belonged to him? It all belonged to him. Who was helping him? The tenants, they're, they're just, they don't own any of it. Their job is to take care of it, to water it if necessary, et cetera, et cetera. And, and get then, a piece of the action. And get a piece of the action to, and return what, was, what, the, what belonged to the landowner to him. Well, when the time came for the, them to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive a share of the harvest. The tenants grabbed his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, the man 
sent other slaves more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. Surely they will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him, and we will get his property. So they grabbed him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus answered. And guess what happens? He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered, and rent the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him his share of the harvest at the right time. And Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read what the scripture says? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. That was done by the Lord. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. And so I tell you, he added Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who produce the, the proper fruits. The chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables and knew that he was talking about them. So they tried to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Mm -hmm. So here we have, this, this is the scenario we're Indeed. talking about. There we are, exactly. I suspect that all the... Pharisees, everyone who heard this was thinking of back of what we call Isaiah 5, mm -hmm. the, when Isaiah talked about the Jewish the nation is like a vineyard. Israel and Judah as mm -hmm. a, a vineyard mm -hmm. and grapevines. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm sure they had lots of sermons on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where do we go next? We, drop, we come back to verse 27. Um, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. What am I doing here? Spelling 21, 27. Um, the next thing that happens is 22, chapter 1. I'm sorry. The parable of the wedding feast. Jesus again used parables and talked to the people. Now, here we've had a perfect example of why Jesus used parables. Why does he use parables? It's easy for them to understand. Something Say it again. Easy for them to understand yeah. and something... They understand the story and... Something they can relate to. And... And he can't get trapped by the words that he uses. So, in other words, they have to draw their own conclusions yeah. as to the meaning of the story, right? So they can't accuse Jesus of saying anything. He just told a story, right? Yeah. They know what he's saying, but they can't trap him, right? Come up with your own conclusions. That's kind of good by itself, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, now look at Matthew 22, verse 1. Let another story. Jesus again used parables in talking to the people. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to tell the invited guests to come to the feast, but they did not want to come. So he sent other servants with this message for the guests. My feast is ready now. My steers and prized calves have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But the invited guests paid no attention and went about their business. <clears throat> One went to his farm, another to his store, while others grabbed the servants, beat them, and killed them. So what do they think about this king? Well, not much. Not much. Very much. Have no respect anyway. They're not happy about this king. And you turn over to Luke 14, verse 15, and it tells, it tells you they're not very happy about this king. The king was very angry, so he sent his soldiers who killed those murderers and burned down their city. Then he called his servants and said to them, what, what, did, what happens next? My wedding feast is ready, but the people I invited do not deserve it. Now go to the main streets and invite the feast as many people as you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike, and the wedding hall was filled with people. So now the king can have his feast, and it looks like there's a great crowd of people there to celebrate the fact that his, king, his son is getting married. Now what was, what was the custom of Jewish weddings here? We need to understand a little bit of the background. How long, first of all, how long did they usually last? Several days. Several days. Often a week. And if it's a king's son, maybe even two weeks. It would go on for a while, you know. And what happened when you showed up for the feast? Um, what did the king do for you? He gave you some clean clothes. He provided everybody a specially prepared wedding garment. 
It was provided gratis. That was part of the, of the reason for coming. So now, verse 11, the king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him. But the man said nothing. Then the king told the servants to tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and gnash his feet, his teeth, I'm sorry. And Jesus concluded, many are invited, but few are chosen. What's, what's the point? Of, now this is really a second parable. He gathered as many as he could find, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Do you think he only found one bad one? Or only one bad one that wouldn't wear the robe? Well, in this case, it sounds like one bad one that, would, that wouldn't wear the <laughs> robe. Yeah. But what does that tell us? When I, when I read this, I see Jesus as our wedding garment. Mm -hmm. So we need to accept Christ mm -hmm. as our Savior, mm -hmm. and then we're dressed properly. Okay. There's no foreknowledge in this one. This is no predestination. No. All are called. Mm -hmm. You're still free to make a choice. But the so why did he say many are invited, but few are chosen? Yeah, he only kicked one out. Yeah. No, uh, all what, the first group didn't come. What, what happened to all the ones who were originally invited? Yeah. Well, they lost out completely. They lost out completely. They were busy doing other things that they felt were more important than the king's special day. Now, is there a time that we read about in the Bible when God is going to hold a feast? Mm -hmm. Where do we read about that? Yes, the, the marriage, Rare, marriage supper, supper of, the of the Lamb, Revelation 21. Yeah, exactly. And who's invited? The good and the bad, as long as they wear a robe. <laughs> Everybody is invited. Yeah, everybody's invited. Who's going to be there? Around. Only the people who choose to be there. I am. <laughs> I pray so hard. Yeah. Let's hope every one of us and every one of you watching will be there. So when you say chosen, it's not necessarily first person? No. It's the third person that has chosen? Or is, well, the, is there one, is there anybody that is not chosen? Well, well, he, he uh, can put it across like they chose to be there, not mm -hmm. somebody else chose to let them in. Is yeah, chose to invite you kind of everybody. He invited yeah. everybody. Finally, he got to a place where he was out sending his servants out in the streets and says, get in here, you know, invited everybody. But and few were chosen. Yeah, few were chosen. You think so that's the he invited everybody, but few were chosen. Few. And you're saying that the people who stayed chose to stay. Mm -hmm. And the, the chosen part is the people who yeah. decided Going to Going out and compelling them to come in, is that a model for the loud cry? Well... I'll let you think about that one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, compelling. I think, I think the people at the end of time are going to be saying, brother, do you realize what time is going on in history? Pay attention. Listen to this. I mean, it'll be as compelling as they can make it. Even though there are overtones to the end of time relationship between mm -hmm. God and his people, isn't, isn't there also a more immediate application here? Isn't it also that the, the, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, the Jewish system had been chosen? These priests had been endowed with all of this information, certainly in regards to the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And, and um, they're now being They should uh, have rejected. done better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now they're going to go after Jesus. They're going to catch him one way or another. <laughs> verse 15, Matthew 22, starting with verse 15. The Pharisees went off and made a plan to trap Jesus with questions. Then they sent him some of the, their disciples and some members of Herod's party. And why were they sending their disciples and the members of Herod's party? Well, perhaps he wouldn't recognize them. Maybe he won't recognize these guys, right? Teacher, they said, we know that you tell the truth. That was quite a... <laughs> quite <laughs> Here come the apples. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you by, teach by the, the way, Luke 20, verse 20 in the new NIV says, who pretended to be honest. Yes. The people who went. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you teach the truth about God's will for people. 
without worrying about what others think because you pay no attention to anyone's status. <laughs> Boy, that's truism. <laughs> that's about as true as you can put it, right? And very opposite to what they were doing. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor or not? Now, what's the trap here? Here they go again. <laughs> here they go again. Yeah. yeah. What's who's, the trap? Who's more important, Caesar? God or Caesar? Okay. But be a little more detailed. Isn't a prophet, <laughs> if he says, if he pays, I've forgotten what it this, is. That's the temple, that's that's the temple tax. Oh, that's the temple this, tax. That's this, right. this, this is a is question of paying taxes. Yeah. yeah. To do Caesar. you obey the laws of the land or don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and or, in other words, the Jews really chafed under paying taxes to Rome. They did not like it. And so th their trap was, if he says pay taxes to Rome, which was the legal law, they're going to say, well, you see, this guy isn't a good Jew. He says pay taxes to Rome. Right. If he says, no, don't pay taxes to Rome, they're going to say, what? He's a rebel. This guy is a traitor. This, he, Romans, come quick, arrest him. He's, he's against the government. What about, what about not the priests listening to all of this and the Pharisees, but what about the rest of the people, mm -hmm. the, the, the rest of the audience here, who is chafing under this and who is looking for the king to come? Exactly. And so we don't have to fiddle with all of this. So yes. Jesus, they're trying to put Jesus in, in a spot in front of the very own yes. people that are supporting him. Jesus, however, it goes on to say, verse 18, was aware of their evil plan. I mean, you know, after oh, all, you'd think they'd have figured out that he, he knew about their plots every time before they even started questioning him. Why tempt ye me, ye yeah. hypocrites? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Has knew. He planned this. Has he known these things are going to come up again? So he's 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 set aside a time when he's going to put his stories together, or is this just totally spontaneous here? Jesus just knew what was coming. He knew them inside and out. You hypocrites! Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin for paying the tax. <laughs> he was straight smart. He'd grown up with this. He knew absolutely. What was they brought him the coin and he asked them, whose face and name are these? The emperor's the answer. So Jesus said to them, well then, pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor and pay God to God what belongs to God. <laughs> when they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. I mean, what, what can you say? What could you say? Well, he also pointed out that not everything belonged to Caesar. Yes. Yeah. He, he, he tells the truth but he tells it in a way where nobody can, no, nobody can say, well, you know, he's, 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 he's got a major agenda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or he's trying to, he's trying to re raise a rebellion against Caesar. Right. No. And he's, it's going to be comforting to Caesar to hear him say this, too, yeah. when the stories get back. Yeah, right. So the other thing, though, it kind of, kind of pointed out that there was a difference between the two, too. Mm -hmm. He didn't put them all together. The conclusion of this in Luke 20, verse 26 says on the story, they were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. Yes. Yeah. Checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not done yet. That same day, some Sadducees came to Jesus. Now, the Pharisees have been defeated, so the Sadducees are going to give it a try, right? Some Sadducees came to Jesus and claimed that people will not rise from death. Now, what did the Sadducees believe? They accepted only the first five books of Moses. They believed that when you died, it was all over. You, there was no chance of resurrection. They did not believe in life after this life, and they did not believe in the existence of angels. Okay? So you need to understand those things before you read this story. Teacher, they said, Moses said that if a man who has no children dies, his brother must marry the widow so that they can have children who will be considered the man's children. Now there were seven brothers who used to live here. The oldest got married and died without having children, so he left his widow to his brother. The same thing happened to the second brother, to the third, and finally to all seven. Last of all, the woman died. Now on the day when the dead rise to life, whose wife will she be? All of them had married her. That must have hurt them to say that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but they said, he can't have an answer for this one. No. Yeah. Jesus answered them, how wrong you are. It is because you don't know the scriptures or God's power. 
For when the dead rise to life, they will be like the angels in heaven. Who believed in angels? Not the Sadducees. Who will be like the angels in heaven and will not marry. Now as for the dead rising to life, haven't you ever read what God has told you? He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. When the crowds heard this, they were amazed at his teaching. How does that work? Because they were dead. Well, so, I mean, why would you say he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why would he say that? Well, that's, that's okay. That's a, found, but that's a foundation of their... But what's this of the... Existence. He's the God of the living when they're in their graves. Okay. But they're going to they're gonna live again. Did they exactly. have past tense back then? Oh, yeah. So the, he used present tense. Yes. So that means he still is. Yeah. That means they're still... What he's saying is that these, li these guys, their lives are not over yet. Mm -hmm. They're going to be resurrected. And that's exactly what the Sadducees didn't want to hear. Yeah. Right. But there's, an, there's another thing, too, because uh, elsewhere it says that, that God sees the future mm -hmm. and sees it as though it were now. Yeah. And, and, and uses this same thing. So he, he is the God of the living. Mm -hmm. So, Ken, what have we learned about God from all these stories, all these... Well, we've mentioned several things in going to. Jesus is trying to do several things. First of all, he's trying to teach his disciples not to hold these Pharisees and Sadducees up as their ultimate authority, one. Two, he's trying to teach them, hey, something awful is going to happen to me at the end of this week. But, what? I am divine. I have powers like nobody you ever heard of before. And he demonstrated it in many ways. He's trying to convince them that when he dies, it's not all over. He's trying to tell the people, look, don't hold these, now the crowds now, he's trying to say, listen to what I say, and he's teaching in a way so that every time they, they hear about these things, they think about these things, they, they see a coin with Caesar's face on it, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about the things that Jesus has taught, and they're, they're attracted because they see, I mean, the, the logic of his arguments are so, is so persuasive, how can, you, how can you argue with it? And every, all these common things, Jesus is turning them to be examples of what he wants them to know. And so we'll have to stop there. We'll pick this up next time. Hope you'll be there. Thanks for joining us.